If you ever see an elephant with this on its face, you're probably going to die. That's because this elephant is in must. Must is the time in a male elephant's life where his hormones go through the roof, causing a bull that is incredibly aggressive, extremely irritable, and horrendously horny. Basically, it turns them into 13,000 pound teenagers. And must cause his testosterone levels to shoot up 60 times higher than normal. It also causes them to smell like a thousand goats in one room. Right now, scientists don't know what exactly causes must, but that's only because when they're in it, the elephants are too violent and too unpredictable for scientists to study them without the risk of being put in a history book. That stuff running down their face isn't sweat, it's a tar-like thing called toporin which leaks from glands. Which is why an elephant that looks like this is one of the most homicidal thing God allows to live. The reason is because female elephants are only in the mood once about every five years. Whenever there's a chance to get laid, all the male elephants in the area will start running fades with each other, sometimes to death. For about two weeks, they'll actively try to put each other out of commission just to have a shot. The bull elephants that lose and don't get a chance to mate will sometimes take out their anger by bullying baby elephants just to get their mother's attention. And in some parks with not enough females, bull elephants will go out of their way to CSI rhinos for no reason at all. Yeah, this actually happens. Elephants usually stay in must for about two to three months, which means for two to three months they are the most dangerous and disrespectful living thing on the planet. There's being down bad, and there's death stroking a rhino that just wanted directions to the watering hole. There's literally no way this video isn't getting taken down. Well, if you're watching this, it means I haven't been banned yet. You probably want to know why this prolapsed anus has eyes. That is a soft shell turtle, specifically a Burmese peacock soft shell, found in Burma and Thailand. Yes, the same op from Gumball. And yeah, their shell is soft, flat, and kind of rubbery feeling. The reason for the soft shell is because a light, flexible shell helps them move faster through the water and the muddy bottom of lakes, and it even makes them faster on land. And because they were built for the water, they have long nostrils that work as a built-in snorkel. So looking like an uncircumcised trouser worm helps them breathe while still hiding in the water. And yes, turtles breathe air. I actually got into a legitimate argument about it last week. Like, bro had a degree in biomechanical engineering or whatever, and swore with his whole chest that turtles breathe water like fish. Anyway, this turtle's been around for 144 million years, making it older than flowering plants. But this foreskin with a face is endangered, so there's a chance its contract might not be renewed. Especially since the biggest threat to its way of life is being traded in an East Asian food market. Which I can't say I understand, because it honestly looks like a third grade dick joke that somebody accidentally gave life. So people spam me that video, and a lot of y'all thought that was some kind of bat or a sugar glider. Someone even asked me if it was a horrifically deformed flying squirrel. But I personally don't think it's any of those. I think that Pokemon was a Kalugo, and if you don't know what that is, don't feel bad. Most of science doesn't either. They're called flying lemurs, but it turns out they're not lemurs. In fact, they're not even primates, they're just related. That weird cousin that only shows up to every fourth family reunion. So even though their closest relatives are primates like lemurs, gorillas, and, you know, us, this meth squirrel is basically its own thing. And thanks to that stretchy membrane called a patagium, the Kalugo can glide for well over 650 feet between trees. Couldn't really tell where this video was from, but its flying identity crisis is found in the rainforest of Southeast Asia. There's two flavors of this furry kite. You got the Sunda flying lemur and the Philippines flying lemur. But I cannot stress this enough, they're not lemurs. I'm not exactly sure what they are, but it isn't a lemur. My best guess is somebody got in God's studio and tried to draw bats strictly from memory, and this was the outcome. Also, they're tiny vegans that eat leaves, shoots, sap, and fruit. By far, their biggest op is the Philippines eagle, which claps them on an egregious level. But somehow, they're not endangered, so I guess this hammock puppy's doing something right. I'm gonna say some things, and it might upset people, but it has to be said. I really think Christopher Columbus at least one manatee in his life. His bro was at sea for what, seven, eight, nine months, and what he thought were three mermaids in the Dominican Republic were actually three West Indian manatees. I guess if you look at their skeleton, you can kinda see how that happened. Also, West Indian manatees can tip the scales at 1,300 pounds, so I'm guessing they were just really body positive back then. But not that positive, because Columbus actually wrote that he was disappointed that the mermaids weren't as beautiful as streets told him they would be, especially since their faces had too many masculine features. I mean, I guess? Like, disappointed doesn't mean he didn't see it through. So this last fact, dear God. Apparently, a manatee's vegeta is more anatomically similar to that of humans than any other animal. I don't even know how many laws or manatees got violated for such a fact to exist. Could be cat, but I'm not finna research it, because that's one list I do not need to be on. But when you put all the pieces together, if Christopher didn't pipe a manatee, an attempt was certainly made. And since manatees are too unbothered, it probably just let it happen. Columbus didn't discover America, but he might have discovered Rule 34. He came, he saw, he conquered. Just not in that order. You really don't have to see it through, my boy. And now that I think about it, that llama story suddenly sounds a lot more real. God bless America. That's cute, really, it's adorable. 
but I bet I can find three animals that sound way worse, and just because, I'm gonna make sure they're all from Australia. Number one, there's two types of people in the world, there's the innocent, and there's those who know what this outback bush bear sound like. On the outside, you see a teddy bear, that is, until they open their mouth and you hear Satan's indigestion. Just in case at least one of you doesn't believe me. You know, sometimes I think if koalas lived anywhere but Australia, they wouldn't be so out of line. Number two is the blue penguin, also known as the fairy penguin. They're the smallest penguins in the world, and once a year they emerge from the ocean and nest under people's homes. It's all fun and games until you find out what a penguin trying to pipe sounds like. Sh ain't sweet. And number three, I've personally slandered this hellspawn a thousand times, I'm gonna do it again and y'all just gonna have to be okay with it. Cause I would forgive everything, like literally. Everything about the cassowary if they didn't sound like this There's actually a pretty cool story behind this first of all these are Japanese macaques and no other primate lives in a colder neighborhood Especially in the mountains. So they're like almost scary smart for example Somebody once left a bunch of sweet potatoes on a Japanese beach and one of the monkeys watched a woman wash her food in river water the Macaque said bet and she started washing her food in the river water and She would even dip the clean food in salty seawater just for taste The rest of the monkeys watched her do this and then copied her to the point where it was passed on from generation to generation That's basically what's happening here once in the 60s during a freezing winter night a female macaque named Takiwa saw a bunch of people relaxing in a hot spring she said say less and she joined them and she just kept going back and just as you'd expect from monkey society the others saw her and copied her basically using the spring as a natural hot tub today you can find these snow monkeys taking baths not only to stay warm but to lower their stress level because self-care is essential so much so that in some places you can share a spring with a monkey just keep your phone in your bag because they will steal it and you won't be able to do anything about it moral of this video I don't have one, but tell me this picture ain't vibe. If you struggle with anxiety, you and this animal actually have something in common. This underwater unicorn is a narwhal, and as painfully shy introverts, they can get panic attacks so bad that it kills them. And it's all because they live in hell with AC, so they have a naturally low heartbeat to avoid losing heat and to slow their metabolism. You actually would do the same thing. If you were to take a really cold shower, your heart would slow down and you would find yourself taking deep breaths because of something called the mammalian diving reflex. Which is why a narwhal's heart only beats about 10 times a minute. The problem is, when a narwhal is afraid or stressed, their heartbeat actually slows down even more. A scared narwhal's heart might beat only 3 to 4 times a minute. Which is bad. Because while the narwhal is freaking out and trying to swim away, its heart is doing the exact opposite of what you would want a heart to do. Which is why it is very possible for a narwhal to die from a panic attack. The good news is, narwhals aren't afraid of a whole lot of things. The bad news is, most are terrified of us, which makes it difficult to study them because just the sight of us can possibly send them into a panic. So if you have anxiety and you'd rather go shopping for your own casket than interact with people, Maybe you're not weird. Maybe you're just a narwhal. Animals that you wouldn't believe were real if cameras didn't exist. This is real, and it's a musk deer. It's technically not even a real deer, and even though it has Dracula's teeth, it's a vegetarian that eats mostly lichen. This hell bambi uses those tusks to fight and flex for females, and the bigger the teeth, the more attractive they are to the lady deer. Basically, they use those fangs for the same reason normal deer use antlers, for running fades and finding females. They also mark their hood with musk, and people often hunt this deer to use their musk for perfume, because why the wouldn't we? This is a stock-eyed fly and proof that even evolution runs out of ideas. Its eyes are social distancing. Its glasses would need a passport. And like almost every questionable thing in nature, if you ever see something that doesn't make sense, it usually has something to do with getting laid. These hammerhead flies will size up and compare eye spans. Not even kidding, the males get into eye stalk measuring contests and whoever has the longest stalk has the best chance at pulling females. The only reason their eyes are in a long distance relationship is because the females have a really weird preference. And now we have the Saiga. I've watched not one second of it, but I can look at this and confidently say it looks like Star Wars, and I don't know what makes me say that. You can find the Saiga in places like Mongolia, but there's only about 50,000 of them left. That nose job helps them by filtering out the dust from the air that they breathe. In the winter, that nose heats up cold air before it gets to the lungs, keeping this Narnia donkey warm. It also makes them the cutest type of ugly. We gotta protect this Squidward pony at all costs. This little guy actually has three eyes. This dude is a Tuatara and it's found in New Zealand, which is really just Australia's nerfed little brother. It's not even a lizard, it's the only living member of a family that was around 200 million years ago, which basically makes it a walking fossil. Its third eye is on the top of its head and it's called the parietal eye. You can only really see it when they're babies because when they're first born there's a translucent part of their skull that makes it almost see-through. The third eye comes from a gland called the pineal body which is attached to the brain. Even though it is an eye, they don't see out that eye the way we see through ours. Instead, the Tuatara uses that third eye to absorb ultraviolet rays and make vitamin D. They also use it to detect light because a Tuatara is nocturnal, meaning they're only active at night. Except for the babies, they're active during the day. 
but that's only because the adult Tuatars are cannibals that would put the hatchlings on a shirt if they got the chance. But if they don't get turned into a pack, the Tuatar has a lifespan of about 60 years and some can even be around after 100 trips around the sun. Meaning if you get one as a pet, it could live long enough to be at your funeral. Absolutely nothing about this Jurassic reject makes sense. But I'ma let it slide, only cause they're cute.